Hello, hello, and welcome to the Soul Stories podcast. I'm your host, Michelle Ann, and today we are up to episode number 10, one, zero, and I am going to introduce you to a, a beautiful woman that came into my life uh, over the last couple of years, and she's such a beautiful soul, so I'd like to tell you a little bit about her name is Melanie Taylor, and she ru- runs an amazing beautiful heartfelt business um, called success on purpose and I'd like to just tell you a little bit about her personality and how she makes me feel and then we're going to get into her story and find out how she got where she is now because I have heard your story before Mel and I'm excited to share it with the listeners because I know there's a lot of growth and learning in that so but yeah, Mel and I met at a business course several years ago now and you know those people when you first just speak to them or near them you know straight away that you have a connection I felt that with Mel instantly I was like I like this woman she's my vibe she has got a s-h-i-t together even though you probably don't think you do Mel well (laughs) I don't think you get it together do you (laughs) we never get it together but I just felt I just felt you you could tell when you meet someone, you can usually tell if they've done a fair bit of work on themselves, self-development and healing. And, and I felt that from you instantly. And we just, we got along as a like personality wise quite easily. And I thought, yeah, I really like this lady, except she lived in Melbourne, which was a bit of a pain. So we don't get to see each other very often. Um, but thank, thank you to online. We catch up every now and again, and Mel runs meetups and all sorts of things. So she's based in Melbourne. But I'll let you um, tell the listeners a little bit more about yourself and what your business is now, and then we'll take them back into your childhood. (laughs) Go for it, Mel. Thank you. Very honoured to be here today. And yeah, my business, Success on Purpose. Well, I suppose where that comes from is our default is fear. (laughs) Mm. Um, So we have to be very purposeful about our life, about creating our life. Um, rather than living in, you know, the fear-based reality, um, living in our I'm not good enough, so I'm not worthy, which is very much where I used to live, and the high achiever within and driven by fear and I'm not good enough, which was, yeah, just quite detrimental really to my adrenals, to my to my oh, yeah. soul, to shutting down my heart and to not living the life that, um, yeah, I suppose that we all deserve. Uh, I really didn't really like life that much, so... <laughs> Um, <laughs> it was goddamn hard. So, yeah. So then, well, through a lot of whether I go into that next question or this question, uh, through my own journey of a lot of breakdowns, um, I ended up, yeah, coming towards well, finding business, which I'd never, ever, ever planned in my whole legged life. Um, but I found that the more I became vulnerable, uh, the more healing that I did on myself, I started to share different bits and pieces about myself um, and people said oh wow me too me too oh really you oh you don't look like you've got all that going on and da 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 and then I thought wow this is amazing and then as I started to heal I thought wow I can help a lot of other people out there so then um, my high achiever from within allowed me and I have a very a big strength and love of learning as well so instead of going into academia, I chose to uh, check out what this business thing (laughs) is all about and learn a bit about business. Hence, you know, doing lots of courses and meeting beautiful you. Um, And now I'm four years, four years. Wow. Full time. I I don't count it anymore. I used to count the building of as a nurse and then building my business on the side. But then when I got into full time, I was like, actually, this is the start. Yes. So I count it as this is my fourth year full-time in business, although I was, you know, building it on the side for a while, a few years as I was nursing and then and working on myself, becoming the business person. I think that's been the biggest thing I've had to do, such a different mindset. Um, and, yeah, so now to help lots of other high achievers <laughs> <laughs> release to be driven by love rather than fear, to enjoy life to have more flow, to have more be in your heart. Uh, And my big why is prevention of disease. That's why I do what I do after being a palliative care nurse, having so much disease myself, anxiety, depression, back pain, neck pain, a bit of cancer here and there and things. um, And knowing that we can, yeah, when we're in the right system, so it's called the parasympathetic nervous system, 
um, mm. be in flow and heal our body uh, and have more energy as well. That's what I love. Every year I get older, but I feel younger. That's um, the beautiful gift about doing this work. And you wouldn't know that you had all that going on, but I mean, you don't have it on going on now, but even back then I've seen photos and you wouldn't look at Mel and think, oh, she's got all that going on. Like she's from the outside looking in, you're like, you're beautiful, fit and healthy. You, you, I don't want to say this because you'll screw your nose up, but you're pretty, you know, you, it's like wholesome, beautiful person. And no one would look from the outside and think you had all that going on like in a million years and that's how good us humans get at hiding it of putting a portraying out to the world that we're okay and um that everything's as you like wholesome and normal and my life's good and sometimes we don't even know it ourselves. we're hiding it even from ourselves um because we don't even realize that we're in it and I feel that maybe was was happening with you do you want to take us back to when um either I know you were, well, let's talk a little bit about the palliative care and that'll take us probably back into how you got into nursing and, and the upbringing that you had that brought you into that sort of line of work. So just, so how long were you doing palliative care nursing for and wh- how did that fit into everything with the business? Well, I was a nurse for 18 years. So wow. yeah, this is my fourth year not being a nurse anymore, um, which makes me emotional. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's such an honor. Mm. I just loved it. It's an honor just to. I worked in the most. I suppose that's contributed to my business because I was. I worked in the most vulnerable space ever, which was death and dying. I was a palliative care nurse. I worked with people with oncology in, with, with cancers, uh, and then moved into community palliative care. So I was very honored to go to their homes and. So, uh, miss, <laughs> so I miss it. I can tell you're in tears there. <laughs> I just feel so grateful. It's such a space of. Yeah, people invite you and tell you the most vulnerable things about themselves and um, they don't have much time. And so that's what I learned to do really well was to develop relationships very quickly because people said, you know, you've got to, you've got to develop trust. You've got to de- develop poor rapport. And I was like, hey, <laughs> I don't have time for that. I need to, you know, I need to, to quickly develop trust and rapport with people because they don't have hours, days, who knows when they might die and there might be something on their chest that they just need to get off before they, you know, move on to wherever that is, the next world. So um, I got very good at that. Um, I got good at uh, holding a non-judgmental space for others so that they could heal and share. And um, it was just such a profound privilege. Um, Yeah, people would tell you things that they've never told anyone before in their life. And uh, and I just saw so much beautiful. I, was, I did a two-day workshop last week and I, one of the women actually has cancer and I was just sharing with her how beautiful, um, the beautiful sides of it and how I saw so much healing happen within families and families come together because we're so busy, you know, in our life and mm. I, yeah, I'll do that when I get time and it's like it puts everyone on their knees. It's like, okay, let's, 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 let's stop what we're doing and let's go in and support each other so yeah, I saw so many beautiful things and um, and I listened to, I was always, because I was very shy, which was a gift for me, I was a very good listener. So I was very good at listening to people and their stories. And then there was this theme started coming through and all most of the people that I looked after uh, were very beautiful people that were givers. They were very busy, you know, they would work hard and just give to people all the time and have no, you know, no time for themselves. And I saw this theme coming through and listening to their stories and they talked to me about they knew when they got cancer. They knew that time where they had stress in their lives and and it just floored me, especially as a little graduate nurse. I was like, hang on a minute. <laughs> I thought you got cancer from this or from that or, you know, your genetics and smoking and all of these sort of external environmental factors. But then I, I, it became clear to me that um, there was more going on underneath the surface than, than, I'd, or than I'd thought. And so I was just listening to them, watching them, uh, and then realising that that was me. Most oh, of wow. it was me. I was an incredible giver. I was driven by fear. I put myself at the bottom of the barrel. Like I was always last on the list of anything. Um, And there's nothing I wouldn't do for anybody. And it was killing me actually, um, because I was just always burnt out. I was exhausted. Um, I'd go along and then, you know, you'd get to holidays and then I'd probably just make it to holidays. Too stubborn to ever have sick days. <laughs> so then I'd just get to holidays and then you fall sick and, you know, picking up coughs and colds and, you know, 
shock and back pain and all those types of things. And um, yeah, just this real high achiever that was just driven to change the world. But I had to change myself first. Yeah. No one tells you that. I was brought up in the country and, you know, we're, I'm back in Ballarat now and really beautiful people, big families and give, 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 but there's no reference to actually yourself and where you fit into that and how important it is actually to put yourself first. So I always say fill up yourself and give out your overflow. Um, but, yeah, thankfully in 2010 I um the high achiever was working two jobs. I was working in Melbourne, palliative care, and Ballarat, palliative care, so community. Um, and then I was also doing a postgrad at Melbourne University and training for a half marathon and just the rest of life that you do, you know, <laughs> very social. Um, now I can understand why I had all that on my plate because my body was addicted to being busy. And when I was busy, I felt like I was making a difference. Well, at least I was doing something. I was such a doer in that masculine energy. Um, and then when I was busy, I was the reason I was so busy is because I couldn't stand those thoughts. Yeah. Those, you know, we call it the, you know, the um, itty bitty committee. <laughs> yeah, the inner voice. Not good the enough, you're, you're this, you're that. And so I just created so much busyness in my life. So I didn't have to listen to all those mean voices that I had from within. Um, but thankfully, I broke my wrist. That was the greatest gift that ever happened to me in 2010. Um, when I, it just, yeah, it really showed me the energy that I was coming from and how I was doing life. And had that not happened, I'm quite sure I'd be dead. I have no doubt I'd be dead today. But it showed me that, um, yeah, I was driven by fear. I uh, didn't know how to receive support. When I broke my wrist, I was doing my postgrad as well. So I needed a lot of support and I didn't know how to receive it. It put me in a, I was already in a stress response, but it put me in a massive, massive stress response. And I, I saw how I was just a struggle. Like even I got some tablets to manage my pain. I got two weeks certificate um, when I broke my wrist and I didn't take any of it. I went back, oh, no. to, back into the office. I was like, I'll be right. I'll just work in the office with one arm. Um, and then I was still studying as well. And, you know, if you've ever broken anything, you know what it's like, just washing your hair is a big deal, just doing anything. It slows you down. And when you're running at such a fast pace, um, that was really, really tough for me. So, yeah. And then everyone, I realized everyone was there saying, Mel, can we help you? And I was just like, no, no, I've got this. Um, and then I ended up having a massive breakdown in the office at work and I just lost it. And I just cried and cried. And then I rang up mum and I said, mum, I said, I can't do this anymore. Oh, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> I'm so relating to this. You're talking, to, talking about me here. Keep going. <laughs> yeah. And I said, mum, I can't, I just, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> My beautiful mum, she said, thank God. Will you come Finally. Up? Will you let us look after you? And I was like, Yes. And I suppose I didn't know how to do that because I was always, I was the firstborn. I was always the one that looked out. We had a lot of, whether I go into this or not, with a lot of yeah stuff at home with my dad had bad depression and I was the firstborn and my little sister came along um, 12 years, um, the youngest of our family. Um, we're 12 years between us. And so that's when life was really, dad's was really in bad depression and I took on what I call this inner child role of being the parent. So I've got to look after this family. It's shit's going everywhere. Um, and so then I suppose at 12 and particularly when I was six years of age, my dad had a bad car accident, all these defining moments mm. in your life, you know, you take on these roles. So my identity was looking after everyone. That's who I was. I'd done it for well, decades actually, but that when it came the time for me to receive support, I just didn't know how to do it. So um, yeah, I went back home and um, makes me, I'm very emotional today. <laughs> I do that to people, don't worry, Mel. I make people cry all the time. I say it's not a good session with me if you haven't cried. Yeah, no, I love it. It's um, a form of healing. Talking is a form of healing. Every time you talk about it, every time you bring it up again, it's going to bring up some sort of emotion, even when we think we've done all the healing. We know it's like onion layers. That's a, it's a gratitude. I cry a lot in gratitude. And it's yes, a gratitude. same. Because it's the reality is, and I see so many people in this situation, but I can't, I can't, I can't do anything. Like sometimes you've got to hit rock bottom to come up, you know? Yes. 
But um, if it wasn't for all this, I, I, I tell you, I'd be dead. I would. I would have got cancer and died. I was just, I was such in a stress response. Mm. Um, but yeah, when I went home and then my beautiful sister flew down, um, flew down from Cairns. Oh, wow. It was my other hand. And wow. so she helped me get through my assignments and everything. And then um, big year, that one, of course. Uh, but then what ended up happening, which was quite a bit of another defining moment, was that I ducked the class. So I ended up getting um, the highest academic achievement and won what's called the, um, the, the Order of Malta Award. So it was a massive big deal because it was in this, um, you know, space of palliative care and with all... Um, medico so there was doctors and nurses and social workers and physios and, and and I was one of the youngest in the course and I remember being up there receiving um because I got first class on it so I was straight A's straight A pluses the whole way like the high achievement <laughs> broken wrist and all uh, but when I was up there receiving the award I um I, I sort of, I had this moment where I looked around and everyone's got their, you know, big wigs on and there's hundreds of people there and it was, you know, quite a big deal. I was very nervous, of course, because this is back when I was incredibly shy and didn't like public speaking at all. But because I love writing, I'm an author and all that, and I, I wrote a beautiful speech. So I had that and I had that written down. So I was like, I'm right, I've got this. So I just read the speech out and made everyone cry, <laughs> which I do. <laughs> and so that, you know, I had the confidence behind that. But I had this moment where I looked around the room and I was like, I think this is a big deal. And then I thought, shit, I, I can achieve so much being hard and cruel and, you know, forcing life and mean to myself. And then I just had this moment where I went, well, imagine what would happen if I was kind and loving to myself. Mm. And then that's when this, this switch flicked in me. And then, of course, I didn't know how to do it. <laughs> I had no idea. Mm. But of course, you know, when the student's ready, the, the teacher appears. So then I ended up going off to Nepal a couple of weeks later. I did some volunteer work over there teaching nurses. And I spent two weeks in a room with one of my beautiful colleagues, who's um, one of my dearest best friends now. And yeah, we just, we'd have these, every night we just talk and talk and talk. And she just talked about her story and she talked about this mentor she was seeing and limiting beliefs and how it had changed her life. And I was like, oh my God. I said, I've got all of those limiting beliefs. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy. You know, but my life looked like I was totally good enough. I was totally worthy. Like I was achieving so much. But at the end of the day, I was so lacking in self-love and deserving of it. And I didn't know how to feel. I didn't know how to feel the, that's why I love crying and appreciation because that was way off my radar <laughs> years ago. I never, I never felt, all I felt was stressed and I'd be tick, yeah, what's next? Tick, what's next? And then, yeah, and she spoke about this mentor and I just said to her, I need to see this mentor. And so as soon as I got back, I rang her in the January and she worked, she was in Sydney. So we just did um, chats over the phone and yeah, started to uncover all these limiting beliefs, do lots of the inner child work, um, started to learn how to practice self-love, even, you know, what that was. And, and then, yeah, it's taking me on this beautiful journey of, you know, where I am today. And, and then I just thought I got headhunted as well. They asked me to become like a, an academic and a lecturer and do some work at Melbourne Uni and um, to help in palliative care. And it was a, like I was really honoured. It was a huge honour to be even asked. Uh, but it just didn't sit right with me. I thought I'm, I'm more of a, a people person. I love being with people. I'm a cuddler. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a feeler. So I just said, thank you so much and just sort of let it go. And then things started to evolve. And then it was another nurse that sent me a message one day in Facebook and just said, Mal, there's this guy coming to town. He's a mentor and a business entrepreneur and all that sort of stuff. And I reckon you'd be interested in him. And um, God bless her. <laughs> I know women, you know, nurses have very good intuition. Yes. And yeah. And that was another great gift for me because um, I was so excited. I was like, yeah, I want to learn about this. And it, and it was like a two day course over the weekend in Melbourne. Um, and another defining moment in my life because um, my uncle was dying. Um, he was like a father, a father to me. And um, I had to make a decision. Do I go to this course or do I stay home with my family? Mm. Being what I love to do is being with him when he was dying. and Or 
do for the very first time in my whole life do I put myself first wow holy crap yeah it was I seem to learn my lessons my lessons are always learned in a big way <laughs> yes that's because so, you, yeah. you do everything by not by half so your lessons are not by halves either no that's right so I just sat with it sat with it sat with it and then, of course, asked a few questions and, you know, checked in with everyone. And, and then um, I just made the decision and I just said um, to mum and I said, I'm going to go. Um, and she was amazing about it. She said, yes, go, great. And <clears throat> so I think everyone was fine about it, but I wasn't. I was like, oh, but I want to, I was like pulled. I wanted to be mm. there when he was dying because um, I love nothing more to sit with people when they die. It's just such an honour and when they take that last breath and you just see this peacefulness, it's just delicious. Um, but yeah, it was, that was my turn. It was time for me. And he gave me that great gift and he ended up dying um, that morning. Like it was about 5am. Wow. So the course was at nine o'clock and so I got the news and um, do you know what? I became the entrepreneur and the business owner then in that yep. moment. I was just able to, park that for the moment and just be the professional and be there for the two days and just absorb all the information. I just absorbed it, absorbed it. Um, and then uh, ended up then on the Monday morning, then I was able to pick that back up and they asked me to do the eulogy. And so then I was able to step in and grieve and, you know, go through that whole process. But um, yeah, it was, it was an incredible time. And I ended up signing up to do the business course um, so much healing happened. I didn't have the money, and but I just rang dad. And, and that was a big thing for me as well, <laughs> to ask for support. And I just rang dad and I said, dad, there's this course, it's $5,000 for the year um, and I want to do it. <clears throat> and he said, yeah, no worries. So he gave me the money, ended up paying him back, ended up making that, you know, fair, you know, it was that investment, you, you know, pays dividends. Um, but yeah, so many lessons in that. And then, um, yeah, learn about this business course and then started to do the healing and the energetic work as well and brought that into it. And then, yeah, life just transpired where I suppose I started to learn how to become vulnerable. I started to share my story and then people were like, yeah, me too, me too. And then, you know, started to develop a business out of it. So, um, that's really who my ideal client is. I can see that now because it's a past version of me. That's who I can help because I just get them so well. It's the high achievers. We want to make a difference in the world, but we don't know how to do it. You know, yeah. we're healing ourselves. And I so, I, yeah. So your high achievement, uh, I know that looking after people and everything came from your childhood. I'm guessing your high achievement did as well. Can you see where in your childhood that started from? Um, yeah, when I was six, well, and because I'm the firstborn as well, I think, um, you, so, at the, you know, and having understood myself so much is that our brain makes a decision. So I was the firstborn, obviously had all mum's love and dad's love. And, and then my little sister comes along and then my brain makes a decision. Oh, well, she, now she's getting the attention. Hang on a minute. <laughs> What's this all about? And so then I'm filing, oh, I'm not good enough. And so my brain's making that decision. So then what do I have to do? Well, I want mum and dad's attention too. So then I become the good girl. And then, you know, doing, I help mum out, help dad out. And they go, yeah, thank you, mum. You know, thank you. You're a good girl. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I'm starting to get love from them in that way. Um, and then, of course, our body gets addicted to it. More kids come along, other defining moments where I'm filing more belief systems. And then, um, yeah, become that in order to get people, if I be good, do things well, I will get, I'll get love from everybody. Um, and then I ramped up as well what I call the trophy child, so that hero child, um, hence where my academia and things, and that was to get dad's love. <laughs> because when I did good things, dad would turn up because he was he had lots of depression and anxiety and and he ended up retiring very early and attempted suicide, like all yeah, all sorts of things happened. And um, and he was never really there for me. Like he would never ring me up and say, you know, how, how are you going today or anything, because he was sort of too sick. But when I did great things, he was always there. So um, I caught myself one day. So hence my academia, you know, ducks in the class and all this sort of stuff. And 
then I when I started business I went on to do Toastmasters because dad also did Toastmasters mm. he's a charismatic man and lots of them seeing and and I had such a fear of public speaking so I started doing Toastmasters and and then I was like this block of ice when I first started. I was paralyzed with fear, but I just, I, I look back at myself and go, how the hell did I do that? I was so nervous, but I just kept showing up. I kept showing up. And then um, I ended up uh, competing at state level in a competition. And I got through to, and then everyone was, then the next, there was one person would go through to America. And then um, I was there and, you know, did my speech. And of course it had a palliative care. <laughs> <laughs> um, this beautiful um yeah young girl that I looked after and so once again I had everybody in tears and it was a beautiful speech and um and then the feedback I got was that I didn't do my arms properly or something what um oh because you there's all you know you got to walk the stage and stop here right. and pause here and put your arms here and all this sort of stuff and and then I just went oh yeah okay that's fine and then um, I just checked, I don't know, something, and I just checked in with myself and I went, what's going on here? <laughs> Why am I doing this? Because that's really not who I am. I'm, well, I've let go of so much perfection and I can, I'm, I can only be me and I'm not perfect. I'm not really into this whole, like, you've got to do all this perfectly. I just like to public speak as me and, you know, and really come from the heart. And so I checked in with myself and I'm like, what are you doing here? And then it just dropped in. It was to get dad's love because every time I did wonderful things, he was there. He was there supporting me. And otherwise, you know, he just sort of wasn't around. And so then I just said to my inner child, uh, which my mentor had been telling me for ages, she's like, Mel, you don't need your dad's love. All you need is that love from within. And, and then I finally got it. I was like, no, we don't need dad's love. And so then I just said to my inner child, have you had enough? Come on, we can do this. Let's find that love, you know, from within. And so, um, yeah, let go of that. I ended up quitting. I ended up stopping doing Toastmasters. Um, and then I've done so much more public speaking since that. But in my, in for me, in my authenticity, just showing up as me, not as this perfect, you know, public speaker. So I'm, yeah, all over the shop, but that's perfect. <laughs> so, yeah. And that would have been big for you to quit something knowing you. No, I only saying this because I'm relating because we're very similar, but to quit something for an overachiever, that's massive. Yeah. Well, I suppose I'd, I knew I'd just learn everything I needed to learn there. And I thought, no, nah, I can't, I'd be incongruent for me to stay on because then mm. it would be about really embodying the perfect way to be the public speaker. Mm. All of that stuff, and you know, being on the stage and no, 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 no. And I just went, yeah, no, nah, that doesn't fit with me. So, yeah, so let that go, and then and then started to really build this, um, yeah, letting go of that hero child, letting go of that parent within and the nurse, the, the carer that was within me, so that I could actually shift those roles and use those skills and have strength strengths I'd learnt on myself. Mm. So, um, yeah, all of these inner child roles and are great because I, we learn so much from them. So, but I had to flip the switch in love rather than fear because I was always doing them in fear rather than in love. So do you grieve it when you let go of these identities? Is there a period yeah. where you grieve or like, how does that yeah. work for you? Yeah. So it's called, you need to, you actually need to constantly be going through processes of what's called apoptosis. So it's the grief cycle, which is the cell death. If you don't grieve for anything, you don't finish it and you don't allow the release within your body. So the, the death, the cells actually die. So that's how you reprogram your brain, your neural nets, those belief systems. Yeah. Um, and that's what a lot of people don't do. And like people will come to me and they'll say, Mal, I've done so much work on myself. And I say, yeah, you have, but you haven't actually been in the right zone. You haven't been in that parasympathetic nervous system. You've been in the stress response. Mm. You've done so much work on yourself, but you actually, it's like we're trying to build, um, what did my mentor say the other day? Um, it's like you're trying to put fresh flowers in a dirty vase. Mm. And that's what we said, it's just like poking more in. But what we've got to really do is clean out the dirty vase. The, the dirty, sorry, the dirty road, the flowers from the vase. And then, then you put the clean ones in. So mm -hmm. you have to feel your way through life. You have to go through the dark night of the soul. You know, we have 
um, challenges is because as we give up identities, our body, it feels very uncomfortable. That's why I honour everyone that goes on this journey because it's not an easy one. Um, and then you start to rewire your brain to love and then you become addicted to love over um, over fear and then it's about feeling your way through life basically and feeling all the shame feeling all the guilt and releasing them um, and allowing those those belief systems to die as well so the new ones can be built so I am good enough I am worthy and then um, things start to come from that space so life can then become easier which is a godsend I was so addicted to hard <laughs> my whole life it had to be hard um, and that was, you know, I suppose that was an ancestry things as well. You've got to work hard to be worth it. That's where worthiness comes from. But that's the opposite. Worthiness comes from within, not from what you're doing, but who, who you're being in every situation. Wow. That's just massive. And that's what you take your people through. Because you know your half-day workshop's called Permission to Receive. Still, well, still called yeah. that? Has it changed? It to how to rewire your ah. life yes because it's that's what I do really is I, I support rewiring. Rewiring their brain and rewiring it the brain to the heart mm. um, because what happens is as we grow up um, our heart shuts down we start to develop you know emotion so it closes off so the heart wall um, and closes down the right hand side of our brain which is connected to our heart um, so we tend to live in, this is why we become human doings <laughs> rather mm -hmm. than human beings. And then we amplify the left-hand side of our brain, which is our rational thinking mind. And then we're just thinking, thinking, and, and then we've got no energy. And then that's really wired into our adrenals and our stress response. Um, hence why we sort of live off that uh, yeah, adrenaline cycle. Um, so you rewire the brain in this parasympathetic nervous system, which connects to the heart. So your heart starts to, to open up and then the energy comes from that space rather than from, from the kidneys and the cortisol and the adrenaline response, which is the stress response. So interesting. Cause I remember when I gave up coffee for the first time, cause I'm exactly like that. I was just, and I still am. I feel like I'm listening to you. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I've got some work to do, man. Because I'm still in that. I'm a lot better than I was, but I'm still in it at a lot of the doing, the being. Anyone that watches anything of my stories, they're all saying, I don't know how you're doing so much. And it's a badge of honor. It gets to that point, like, as same as what you said. But when the first thing I did was give up caffeine and it changed my life. But what I realized, I was addicted to the drama of the, mm -hmm. like, I remember the first time I hadn't had a coffee for a couple of days and I didn't think I was addicted to coffee because I'd have one a day, but my body was so sensitive to coffee that that one coffee would send me like literally over the edge. And so I remember I hadn't had a coffee for a couple of days and I was driving and I'm thinking, there's no, I was bored. I was like literally bored because there was no drama. I was like, there's no ups and downs. There's no moodiness. There's no nothing. It was flatlining. And I was like, this is boring. It was amazing because you're addicted, like you're addicted to the adrenaline of the whole thing. Yes. The adrenaline comes the drama. Hey. Well, I think it's the highs and the lows. Yes. Um, I'm what's called a sanguine. You'd be a sanguine as well. It's sort of I am a sanguine. We just talked about that yeah, yesterday. Yeah. So we love, we love, we we love life. We're we're mm. out there. And then so we we thrive off those highs and lows. Mm. But then as you keep doing this work, you be bring in what's called the choleric. Mm -hmm. So that balances us out. So that's very much that business mind so that we can have, and that's for me, it's both sides of the brain working, what I call the genius brain. Yes. So you're in your left and your right hand, but otherwise we're very much in that left-hand side of the brain um, and then addicted to the adrenaline and the, the yes. spikes and then the troughs. And then, and do you know what it is? It's the attention we get then. Yes. That's exactly what it is because you do get the attention. You do. For the wrong like, reasons. Yeah. Oh, you poor thing. Oh, God, you do a great job. Da 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 da. <laughs> da 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 da. Yes. Yeah, it's that. Superwoman. So, how does your life look now compared to what it did? Like, you're obviously more in your parasympathetic. So, what's yeah. like, what's your days look now, look like now versus how they used to look? It's, I don't need much. Mm. So I'm so I'm gonna cry I'm so happy I'm so happy mm. and for most of my life I was depressed and anxious and not very happy I just didn't even want to be here I just found life hard and I was like god what's this all about <laughs> I don't understand it um but yeah I'm really happy now and 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 COVID's been such a gift for me that just changed 
my reality. I ended up um, staying in Ballarat with my parents, um, ended up there for 13 weeks. Um, and that was just beautiful, you know, just did more inner child work on me, a lot of my inner teenager stuff and, and just, you know, allowed myself to be the, the daughter because I was always the parent of my parents. So I've, I've had to step in and be the daughter and allow myself to be supported. So um, and my business boomed and, and, you know, when I went totally online. And so mum was, you know, cooking and, and doing the, um, the washing and all that sort of stuff. And I was just able to sort of be in my business. So I was busy last year, but I don't know, in a good way, like it, it, um, I ended up increasing my morning routine. So now I was started getting up at 10 to five, which I've continued through. And I have like a two and a half hour self-love ritual of meditation, stretching, you know, exercise, all that sort of stuff. So I really all about filling myself up. And then I think I needed to go through all of that last year to then, okay, now this year, I'm about more time freedom for myself so that it's not, I'm not working quite so much. Um, so then ended up moving back to Ballarat, where I'm from, all my best friends live here, all my family lives here. Uh, now I'm just totally online. So I'm not sort of out networking and all that stuff I used to love, being busy. I do a bit online, but not much. Um, I've got a beautiful garden. <laughs> I love bike riding. My weekends, I don't plan anything anymore. I don't, I don't need to be busy because I need significance and to be doing something. So my life is very open. I know how to say no to things now. Um, I'm very, I, I value uh, my energy. That's the most important thing I have. So I really conserve that. And I also, I always, always ensure that I'm coming from the right space. If someone mm. says, can you do this? Can you do that? I always check in with myself. Am I coming from love or am I coming from fear? You know, every time you say should, I should do that. That means you're coming from fear. So then I, I will never do anything in that space because I know it's going to end up badly for that person. And for me, it will drain my battery. So I'm always checking in like this Friday night, I had a friend's birthday in Melbourne and, and I had to check in with myself. Is that my highest and best good? And I just waited, waited, and then it dropped in. No, not to go. Because then otherwise I'll be flipping myself into busy again. And I've been back to Melbourne sort of the last um, few weeks, but now I just love it. Like I just connect with people. I have beautiful conversations. Like they're really deep all the time and it's just so satisfying. And, and yeah, I don't, I don't need much anymore. That's I don't want to be up on a stage like, you know, but I think because I've let go of that, it all happens anyway, but I don't need it. Like I'm not yeah. setting big goals of this and that and da, da 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 but because I suppose I've let go and I'm in that parasympathetic nervous system it all happens quicker actually I doubled yes. my business and then some last year and I was like holy shit that was yeah like I'd set all my goals and my forecasting and then by June I'd, I'd already done it so um it just yeah it's allowing more ease um so I thrive off getting out of my comfort zone. Mm. That's why, which business gives me, you know, that opportunity to do so much. So then outside of my life, I just love just easy, just being with my people and enjoying life and, you know, being outside. And, but I'm very, yeah, I get up. I have to, this is, this is the point that I want everyone to take away is I have to, I'm very aware of that now. I have to keep doing the work. Mm. I can't. I can't just, I need to meditate every day. I need to do my journaling. I need to do all of my rituals because it keeps me in the parasympathetic nervous system. Otherwise I could quickly shift back into the sympathetic. Um, and I have my own mentors, coaches. I'm doing a course in a leadership course in America now. So I'm constantly working on myself to shift my subconscious mind. But I do more work in that space now than the doing. Mm. So what I call hard work is working on your own heart within and releasing that. So, but when I first got into business, I don't know, you sort of, uh, people tend to teach you, you've got to get out there and work. Mm -hmm. But actually the work you need to do, especially when you start a business, I believe you should be working 90% on your subconscious, your mindset and 10% in your business. That's so true. Wow. You've like a fully changed woman. That's a, that's, that's an incredible story. That is, and I can see it like, and feel it. That's why your business is going so well. 
So I've just got one last question, um, and I don't know the answer to this, but did you make peace with your dad and how all that panned out? Like how did all that play out in the end? Yeah. Well, with him? Did you ever get to talk to him directly about it or was, did it not go that far? Oh, yeah. So um, so he didn't die when he attempted suicide. He ended up living. Um, that was one of my greatest gifts as well because I was very good. I'm very good at thriving <laughs> in stressful situations. So that's why I have like so some of my clients have had a lot of stuff happen to them as well. Um, I'm allowed to hold, I'm able to hold a very deep space for their, for their healing, which is beautiful. Um, so dad's given me that greatest gift. And he's also taught me unconditional love, mm-hmm. uh, which I believe is the hardest lesson to learn in this, in this lifetime. So I've, I learned to love dad for who he, just for him and the lessons that he taught me. And so I, this is my belief system is that everyone mirrors us. So dad's anxiety and depression was really, he was mirroring me. And then as I healed myself um, and my unloved parts, then he didn't mirror that back anymore. And that really cleaned up during COVID last year when I was living back there and just kept doing a lot of inner child, you know, there was inner child, but the inner teenager within who had lots of anxiety and depression, healing that. And then I did some work on releasing a karmic contract so that I didn't have to mirror back stuff to dad and he didn't have to mirror we could just live our life so no more codependence mm. um and then the biggest miracle happened is then after i did that it was probably only two weeks later um he took himself through a detox and he, he's been on like antidepressants his whole life and valiums and things and he, he detoxed himself for a month and i was so proud of him he just he went off everything no alcohol to all these drugs just went off them and he went through it was i know it was hell for him and he lost quite a bit of weight um but it's like it re-kicked his body and then i think it probably cleaned out his liver and then he ended up going on another antidepressant and he's never been as happy as he is now like he's back to his former days his loving life and so I just see now the power of doing the work on yourself, how you can, because then people don't have to mirror that back anymore. You learn your lessons, they show up differently and it, and it heals them. Yeah, your healing is their healing. It happens so often. The child does the healing for the parents and the grandparents and, the, as you said, the ancestral line before that. It's an energetic thing. Yeah. yeah. That's so, amazing. Um, life is bliss. Life is, especially my family stuff, we've gone through a lot and now there's so much peace and love there. And But all those challenges brought that. Like that's the good thing about your challenges in life. But you just need people to support you in knowing how to flip that switch, you know, mm. being wow. with on our own. So if people are resonating with what you're saying and feeling that they want to get in contact with you, which I, there's going to be some people, I guarantee you that are going to go, wow, this woman's amazing. I need to talk to her. What's the best way to get in contact? You you have a website, I'm guessing. Yeah. So uh, www.successonpurpose.net.au. Yep. Um, on Facebook, uh, Melanie Taylor and Melanie with an O yep. <laughs> message me. Um, or send me an email, which is melanie at successonpurpose.net.au. Yeah, definitely. I know there'll be people coming out of the woodwork for this one. I mean, every time I do a podcast, I get people messaging me saying, like, everyone just resonates with everyone differently. And, um, yeah, so I can't wait to hear what people think about this one. It's going to be good. So I'll pass on any messages if you've got. And if you're too scared to, like, contact Mel herself and you, but you'd still like to pass on what this podcast meant to you, feel free to message it through to me and I'll pass it on. So because we're all human and even though we don't need all the uh accolades especially you Mel because you've done so much work on yourself don't need them it's still lovely and it feels nice to know that you're helping people and changing people's lives so pass them on definitely yeah, it makes I it makes me emotional because it makes my journey so worth it mm-hmm. yeah because you're helping so many more people it's just beautiful and now we're going to get into the deep questions before we go because that's not been deep enough you know <laughs> Um, and I'm interested to hear your answers to this, knowing that you've done that work in your palliative care and dying and death. And so my first question to you is, what is a soul? What is a soul? I feel like it's that innate being. It's the being within us. It's, it's the light. It's the light that we all are. 
that we've forgotten. <laughs> so that's why we're on this journey of remembering the love and the light that we are and that other people are as well. Yeah, yeah mm. definitely. And what happens after you die? I've actually been there. Oh, do you tell? <laughs> oh, God. Um, so I learned how to tap into the unified field. So that's wow. what I call it, the, stiff, the divine matrix, the universe, whatever. So I, I'm able to go because I've been doing it for so long and I'm in such a safe space and my parasympathetic nervous system that I can go out to that unified field. And so I learned how to do it. That's why my business boomed last year. I just kept going out to the field and creating possibility and clients just kept coming in. And I'm like, where are these people coming from? And I was like, oh, my God, it's because I'm, I'm tapping into possibility. It's like we call it you collapse a quantum field. Mm. You bring that into your reality. And so that's how my business boomed. So it wasn't from me working hard as such. You know, It was I was just receiving and bringing in that energy. And so I learned how to do that. And then one day I was in, was last year, I was in Pilates. And um, I just went in Pilates, uh, I'd have, you know, I sit in my parasympathetic nervous system. So I was just sitting in my body, just feeling in my body. And next thing, I just went out to the field. Uh, but I went to heaven. Wow. And I was uncontrollably crying. The love is, I can't even, there's no words to explain it. So it was just this immense love. And I was just crying and my instructor was there and he was just like, he's one of my clients so he gets it he was just holding his space and just watching me cry 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 I don't even know how long I was there for and then I just came back I was like oh my god we've got nothing to worry about we are so loved there is just so much love everywhere and then um and, and then, I, then I just told him what happened and then um I it was actually a, it was a wonderful thing but then it was really hard because then for the next day I was like I don't want to be here yeah, I've heard that. Yeah. This is so dense. Like you feel the, the duality, the vibration of heaven is so light and just love and then it's very dense here. So for a day, I was like, I don't want to be here. <laughs> this is shit. Um, so heavy. But then, of course, I forgot. I forgot. I suppose it's like when you have a baby, you forget. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So then, um, but, and I suppose I was able to go there probably because all the work I've done in palliative care and, and everything, but. It is so much, it's just love. That's what's after this world, love. Love at a, a level that you'll never, you can't even comprehend. It's, yeah, but I, yeah, it's beautiful because it gave me insight into all my patients that have died. Mm. Got nothing to fear. Of. And I've had other clients die because I've, I've worked with quite a few people with cancer. Um, and yeah, I'll never, ever, I'll never be sad about people dying anymore. Because they're the lucky ones. <laughs> you know now, you felt it. <laughs> they go off to the most magnificent place. Um, and I think we're very brave to be here. Um, and, and bringing it, so we say bringing heaven to earth so that we're living that love in, the, in, this, in this lifetime rather than waiting to go off um, to the next one. So, yeah, we're very, very, very loved. Wow. That's the best answer yet I've had. <laughs> I've been there. I love that. Yeah, I can tell you because I know that's good. And you've seen it with so many of your clients too. As you said, you've watched this happen. You've watched the piece. You've seen it all unfold in front of you and you felt it. Like it's not even physically what you can see. I'm guessing you can, if you're that tapped into energy um, and you're around people that are dying, you would feel it. I'm guessing. Yeah, I'm a, yeah, I'm a feeler. I'm yes, very so. much a feeler. Yeah. Mm. And my last question is, what do you know for sure? Which you sort of semi-answered then, but. Well, that I know nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, just constantly learning, constantly evolving and everything is bringing us to love. Mm. Sometimes it doesn't seem that way, but it, it, everything is leading us back to love. So it's basically tap into our hearts because that's where everything sits. That's the answers in our hearts. Is that how you feel? Oh, you tap into the higher heart. The higher heart. Okay. Yep. The physical heart is full of fear, shame, guilt. Mm -hmm. So until you clean that out, mm -hmm. um, you yeah, but you we can access access that quickly um, through the higher heart, which is in the center of your chest. Wow. That's to that unified 
higher self, that, that field of energy. Through meditation, is that how you get there to that higher heart area? Well, you've got to release the, the heaviness mm-hmm. as well. Like it is through that, but in order to get there, you've got to teach your body how to be more relaxed. Yeah, like true. you said, get rid of that dirty water first. Yeah. yeah. And, then, yeah. and then it just naturally will tap in. Yeah. Oh, wow. So interesting. God, so good. I want to sit here for hours, but I've got another appointment at 11 o'clock. So we're going to go. Damn it. <laughs> damn it. Damn it. I'm sure you've got something else booked in too, but thank you so much. That was just enlightening to me. Um, I'm going to listen to it again. And yeah, I, I've i got a journey ahead of me, I feel like that's no coincidence that I was chatting to you. And I, and I know the bits of your story but it really hit home for me today like resonated big time um particularly with the dad thing I had a bit of a meltdown it was only two days ago and I was found myself on my dad's shoulders crying and it's funny now that you're talking about your dad and your relationship and I thought that's no coincidence so I'm like truly truly grateful from the bottom of my heart for you just doing what you do being who you are and being like that brave I know you don't feel brave but as you said we're the we're doing that like we're the humans here we're we're doing the the work and you're doing it for the collective like it's just and to watch oh I can't I, I can just see the change I can see even though I don't know I didn't know you back then I can feel it because I've been there and to hear you talk about your life now that was probably my favorite bit of the whole podcast was to hear how you live your life now like that's mind-blowing mm. that's a place to look forward to yeah, absolutely. And everyone can get there. That's the good news about this story. Mm. Do you have your do you have a podcast yet? No, it hasn't really. I just oh. do things through feeling. Like I feel the field open up and it's like yeah. right now, but I haven't felt that open that calling up. yet. Oh well, yeah. I'll be a fan if you do. So let me know. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, I loved it. Thank you so much. Bye. And um yes, yeah, so we will catch up soon. Well, what's love? See you gorgeous. Thank you. Bye.